The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hello, I'm Pastor David Graham of Grace Community Church in Boulder City, Nevada. This is our weekly worship service online. I'm so glad you've joined us. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love. Thank you, Lord, for knowing who we are and selecting us to be part of your forever family. We ask now that as we spend a few moments together that your spirit would move into our hearts and lives. You would continue the process of transforming us to what we once were, to what we shall become. And we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in this endeavor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. announcement I have is on February 19th, there will be a board meeting at one o'clock in the social room. It'll be the first one for this 2023 year. There should be a few new faces, uh, new chairs of uh, various commissions, and we should have a wonderful time together taking care of the business of the local church here at Grace Community Church in Boulder City. That's my announcement. Thank you. Please join me in singing, I was there to hear your morning cry. I was there to hear your morning cry, I'll be there when you are old. I rejoiced the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. When you were but a child With a faith to suit you well In a blaze of light You wandered off To find where demons dwell When you heard the wonder of the word I was there to cheer you on You were raised to praise the living Lord to whom you now belong If you find someone to share your time And you join your hearts as one I'll be there to make your verses rhyme From dusk till rising sun In the middle ages of your life Not too old, no longer young I'll be there to guide you through the night Complete what I've begun When the evening gently closes round And you shut your weary eyes I'll be there as I have always been With just one more surprise I was there to hear you I'll be there when you are old I rejoiced the day you were baptized To see your life unfold Open the eyes of my See you. 
prayer request. I want to pray for the uh, Wong family. Uh, Heather is getting better. We thank and praise the Lord for answered prayer in her behalf. And uh, they are having to take care of some business and uh, they need our prayers. And so I don't want to go into too much detail there. I uh, also want to remember uh, Myrna Stark. She was recovering from a broken hip. Ask you to continue to pray for a quick healing for her. There are some other uh, strained relationships in the church. Pray that the Holy Spirit would come and calm our hearts, help us to truly love one another and forgive one another when we trespass inadvertently most often. So those are prayer requests. Would you join me in prayer? Father, as we bow our heads, we're concerned about the Turkey situation. Lord, I understand there may be as many as 20,000 people that have lost their lives in this massive earthquake in Turkey. We pray for the people there, Lord. We pray for the families. We pray for comfort where it is needed, Father. And we don't understand. And we're not blaming you or anyone, Lord. It just happened. The tectonic plates shifted. And buildings who are not built very earthquake secure have collapsed and people caught in the rubble have lost their lives, Lord. Please allow emergency services to be quick. Lord, I pray that somehow out of the shared suffering and as we pray for our fellow sufferers, Lord, our brothers and sisters, Lord, we ask, Lord, that your will would be done in lives who have survived. And I pray for those, Lord, who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. Lord, we also think about Ukraine. We lift up the Ukrainian situation, Lord. It's a tough road, Lord. I pray that you would soften and change the Russian president's heart in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for him. We pray that somehow peace would come to that region, as well as peace in, the, in Jerusalem, Lord, with uh, fractured nerves, Lord. And we pray for the East Bank. And we pray for the Palestinians. We pray for the Jews, Lord. We pray that somehow they would find a way, fellow sons and daughters of Abraham, to live with each other in respect and in love. We thank you, Lord. And we pray for those who are ill among us. We pray that you would bring healing for those who have broken bones. We pray for those who are struggling in relationships, Lord. We ask for healing in those areas. We thank and praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your love. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. And now we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Let's begin. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Inherit, let us find the promised rest. 
Scripture reading right now is from Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Wonderful words. And now, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mountain. And he's talking about loving, really loving at a higher level. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And that way, you will be acting as children of your heavenly Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you only love those who love you, what reward is that for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect in love, even as your Father in heaven is perfect in love. Now, I've added in love because that's the point of the message I want to talk to you about. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, He restores my soul. Righteous paths for his name's sake. He restores my soul. Though I walk through the valley filled with the shadow.
the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want Makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, He restores my soul. He leads me in righteous paths for His name's sake. entitled The Strongest Love. We're approaching Valentine's Day. St. Valentine was a real person that lived in the third century. We really don't know very much about him at all. They're kind of a tradition or I suppose a mythology built up around this St. Valentine. One story has it that when uh, the emperor uh, said that if you were married, you didn't have to enlist in the army and fight Rome's battles overseas or around the world. Uh, he made it illegal for soldiers to get married. And so Valentine supposedly went behind closed doors and married young men so they wouldn't have to go and die in a futile war of, of, uh, of uh, empire building. Another story is that he was arrested for those behaviors and thrown in jail. And the jailer had a blind daughter who he prayed for and God healed her eyes. So they became very close. And one day he sent her a little note. And in, on the bottom of it, it said, from your Valentine, using his last name. So we're not sure that it was a romantic thing at all. It was just uh, a little note. But somehow it carried on and became popularized in the uh, Middle Ages. And uh, people would give them a little love note for their beloved and call it, your Valentine, from your Valentine. And whether any of these stories are based in any kind of fact or not, what we do know is that Valentine was eventually beheaded by one of the uh, Roman emperors and made into a saint. And so he is still a patron saint, one of the patron saints in the hierarchy of saints in the Roman Catholic Church. So that's a little bit about Valentine's Day, but now let's just talk about what love is. You know, the dictionary says, love is an intense feeling of deep affection. Is that what love is? As a noun, an intense feeling of deep affection. So if you might feel that towards your spouse or your children or even a close friend or a pet. But do you feel that toward God? We're commanded that we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, and strength. But do we have uh, a, an intense feeling of deep affection for God and for Jesus Christ? That's an interesting thought. So there's this wonderful love equation verse. I call it 1 John 4, 19. It says, uh, we love God because he first loved us. Maybe he initiated this idea of love, that he indeed had an intense feeling of affection for you and I as his sons and daughters. And because we became aware that he loved us very deeply, we decided to love him back. And we need to grow in that love. Well, the words for our text this morning is, you therefore must be perfect and in love as your heavenly Father is perfect in love. Uh, these are words that Jesus was speaking to his followers as he was trying to explain to them the ethics of the new kingdom. 
the kingdom had come in his ministry among them, but was going to come more fully at a later time. And so he is describing how his followers should think and behave. He starts with the Beatitudes, and they are, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, and those kinds of things. And then he moves on, and sometimes we can call these the ethical teaching sayings of Jesus, trying to explain that since his arrival on the earth from another dimension of reality, the Son of God was training his disciples, those who were following him, how to think differently and therefore behave differently. So there were generally accepted norms of human behavior, cultural realities that Jesus challenged in his time among us and was challenging us to live our lives in a significantly otherworldly manner. So a new attitude had to be adopted and a different lifestyle. In Matthew 5, 20, he, he phrased it this way, for I tell you this, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness, always doing the next right thing, learning to be a blessing and letting your light shine, these kinds of ideas. So he challenged all those who followed him, and he challenges us today that we are to live our lives from a kingdom perspective. And this means that our entry into the permanent kingdom, which is from above, implies that we have fully embraced and consistently lived out the ethics of that coming kingdom here and now today. Would you agree with that? So when he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, that's the way it actually reads. But what does he mean? This word perfect is the word teleos in Greek. And it really means fully mature. It, it's not some kind of philosophical perfection that there is no flaw or no tiny little thing going wrong. It's a full maturity. You must be fully mature, a completely self-actualized human being. And it includes also the idea of achievement in function. We are to live and love like God lives and loves among us. So we hear them in context. Therefore, you must love perfectly as your heavenly father loves perfectly. Well, these words were spoken, this perfection idea, this fully mature idea was spoken in the context of a lesson about loving others. And I want to reread that to you in Matthew 43. You have heard that it was says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Now, nobody had ever suggested that before. Pray for those who persecute you. And that way, you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love only those who love you, what good is that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, and I'm suggesting the context is, in love, even as your Father in heaven is perfect in love. So, when we look at the broader context of this, he's talking about loving your neighbor and then loving those who are even opposed to you, the unlovable among you. God himself was speaking to these people. They'd never heard such a thing, yet slowly, for sure, and deeply, these words began to penetrate the hearts of the disciples as they began to grasp the revolutionary nature of this coming kingdom of God, which had broken in to their milieu at this time. And these kingdom values were really upside down from the cultural values that they had grown up in. There was the old way, and now there's going to be a new way, the kingdom way. And of course, the implications are revolutionary. The old way, the common way was to hate an enemy. 
an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But the new way says, no, we're not going to do it that way anymore. From now on, you're going to love your enemy and really pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for those who plot your downfall. Pray for those who, who don't really like you. Still pray for them anyway. This is a stronger kind of love. It's the strongest possible kind of love. What's he saying? Simply this. To love people who are unlovable. Take love to the next level. Really love people who don't like you. Pray for those who persecute you. When you do this, he said, you'll be sons and daughters of your father in heaven. So the true mark of any Christian has always been love. Not when it's convenient, not when it's easy, not to love your spouse, which is important, and your children and the people close to you. Anybody can do that. Everybody does that. He's saying, take it to the next level. Love those who are unworthy of your love. Love those who really dislike you. That's what he's basically saying. Human relationships will always encounter difficulties. The workplace is full of strife. Individuals jockey for position of power in the organization. Perhaps even where you work, perhaps your boss is harsh. Demanding with little no or no compassion for the situation that you're in. You try to explain it, but doesn't want to hear your point of view. And what about churches? There's a lot of that in churches, too. And no matter, it does not matter what kind of group you are in, kind of people. Often there can be uh, difficulties in relationship because Jesus knew that our fallen sin nature would always present a problem from time to time. That's why he said in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God knew it was going to be difficult, but now he's asking us to embrace a stronger kind of love, to really love people who are different, diminished, dirty, or difficult. We don't like people that are not like us or that we don't respect or whose lifestyle or social status is not similar to ours or who have personality defects that rub us the wrong way. They're hard to love. And we certainly don't like people who don't like us. No matter. We're called to love them. Really love them. Not just pretend to love them, but really love them. Really develop an intense affection for them. So, it's easy to love likable people. The challenge is to love unlikable people. God loves like that. So I'm going to give you an example of that. A few years ago, I remember reading about a a mother who learned how to love someone she greatly despised and hated and disliked. What had happened is her daughter had been raped and murdered by a young man who was serving a life sentence in prison. Now, you need to know this lady was a Christian. However, her grief was so great and her Hatred so deep toward the man who had committed this awful crime. Her beautiful little girl would never laugh and sing again. She would not be able to see her grow up through the various stages of life. Her life was snuffed out tragically, horribly, violently. And she grieved her loss for months and months. Often she couldn't sleep at night. And sometimes she would fantasize how she could take revenge If she could, no amount of torture inflicted upon this man, young man who had done this would be enough. Until one night, exhausted from lack of sleep, she heard the still small voice of the Lord begin to speak to her. And here's what he told her. I want you to forgive him and to love him. She knew it was the Lord because she had heard that voice before. And deep within inside of her heart of heart, she knew he was right. That she needed to do just that. But for weeks, she struggled to write a letter of forgiveness to him. Finally, she did it and she mailed it to the prison. But the bitterness in her heart still remained toward the man who had done this terrible thing to her daughter. So 
Weeks later, and a letter arrived from prison. It happened to be from that young man. And it was wet with tear stains. And for 14 pages, he pour, poured out his life story of what had happened. And he told her that his guilt and his remorse was so great that the only relief he ever had was when the chaplain explained to him that God was capable, able, and willing to forgive him for that. And indeed, asked for forgiveness and had become a Christian and now was asking her for her forgiveness. And when she came to those words and she read that, out of rage, she crumpled up that letter and threw it away. But the Lord kept dealing with her. Not only do I want you to forgive him, he said, I want you to go to the prison and become the mother to him he never had. This would only take the grace of God, if you can even imagine this. But one day she drove to the prison to meet him. When he came to the window, he was not the ugly, cruel, giant monster she had envisioned, but a frail and rather shy little boy. She remembered the words of Jesus, but I say to you, love your enemies. As they talked, God began to fill her heart with deep compassion and love for this young man. That first visit turned into many visits and a long and fruitful healing for both of them. She had lost a daughter, but she gained a son and he gained a mother he had never had. You, therefore, must be perfect in love as your heavenly Father is perfect in love. How is the Father perfect in love? He loved us while we were still sinners, while we were estranged from God, while we were in rebellion against God, when we were ignoring God. He still loved us in spite of us. Think about that. So, Let's enter into this. Let's not just talk about it, but let's see if we can take a few steps and wrap ourselves in to this quality of kingdom love. How about it? Are you prepared to grow completely into the fullness of what God has for you in this matter of loving others? You know, we're coming up on Valentine's Day and it's all well and good to buy a card or some flowers and candy to your beloveds in your family, in your life, your children, your spouse, and so forth. But God is asking us to go a step beyond that. In fact, he's trying to help us understand that the strongest love possible in the universe is available to be poured into our hearts. Romans 5.5 5 says, When the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, he imparts this agape quality of love, a love that is unconditional and is an intense feeling of affection, for even people that we find difficult to love. And God is calling each of us right now to a higher standard of love. As I said earlier, the mark of Christianity is love. Are you willing to love like that? To love like God loves? Is there someone that you don't like? Are you willing to forgive and allow God's Holy Spirit to manifest that agape, that unconditional kind of love for that individual or those people. See, we were created originally in the image of God, but it's been perverted through sin in our lives. And God's trying to remake us, for he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, to be just like Jesus. The goal of any true disciple is to live in that perfection, in that maturity, full maturity, that teleos, the extension of this wonderful love. I'm thankful for Valentine's Day. It gives us an opportunity to reflect on what love really is. It's more than emotion. When God said in John 3:16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave. Maybe that's another definition of love. Love is a decision to give. Not that it is earned or deserved by the object being loved, but to just love anyway. And I am praying for you and I pray for myself that we will grow to be the most loving people imaginable. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I confess that I don't always love like 
I'm supposed to. And as I read in your words, sometimes I'm indifferent to the difficulties or sufferings of others outside my circle of family and close friends. And I don't want to be bothered. Yet you said that we are to mature in our love. Please help me, Lord. I'm willing to adapt to the ways of your kingdom. Teach me how to love, to make a decision to love, to develop an intense feeling of infect, affection for God and for people. You love me in spite of me, and I'm so grateful, Lord. And because you first loved me, I choose to love back. Help me to forgive those who trespass against me. In your name and in Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. I love you very much. Can you say that about everybody you've ever met? I love you. God bless you. still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave it to thy God to to shine like the sun.